Welcome to the Sports Ethics Show. The Sports Ethics Show discusses the many ethical and philosophical issues that arise in and around sport. I am Sean Klein, the Sports Ethicist. You can read the Sports Ethicist blog at sportsethicist.com, where you can also download podcasts of previous shows, subscribe to the podcast, or find links to related information. The Sports Ethicist is also on Facebook and Twitter, at Sports Ethicist, and you can email the show at sportsethicist at gmail.com. Today is March 19th, 2015, and my guest today is Seth Bordner. Dr. Bordner is an assistant professor of philosophy at the University of Alabama, where he specializes in the history of modern philosophy. He also has interest more broadly in applied ethics, philosophy of science, and philosophy of sport. Welcome to the show, Seth. Oh, thanks for having me. Well, in, in your, uh, uh, your in, in a recent paper of yours in the Journal of Philosophy of Sport, Call Them As They Are, What's Wrong With Blown Calls and What to Do About Them, you discuss the problem of blown, blown calls, and that's what we're going to talk about today, and you deal with pretty much two main tra tra tracks. Uh, providing an account of what's wrong with officiating mistakes in sport, and then also trying to defend the use of technology to prevent or, or correct uh, these mistakes. And I'd like, uh, I hope our conversation can touch on both those issues. So first, let's jump into the first part, the wrongness of blown calls. That seems pretty straightforward in a lot of ways, but uh, it actually takes up the bulk of your paper, and, and I think there's a lot of interesting arguments that, that you touch on there. So uh, what's so bad about, uh, about blown calls? Well, it's fair to say that I think uh, lots of people think there is something wrong about blown calls, uh, but not uh, up to this point, at least few people have uh, tried to give an account of what it is that makes them wrong. And what when a blown call happens and one team serves uh, or loses uh, an advantage as a result, what's what's bad about that? And in the paper, what I try to do is just uh, lay out several different possible justifications for thinking that uh, blown calls are are problematic and the the two that I keep coming back to are one is a concern about fairness mm -hmm. and uh, this is just the the basic issue that if you're the kind of person who thinks that <clears throat> that uh, sporting contests ought to be fair insofar as both teams are subjected to the same rules held to the same kinds of standards and you know essentially playing on the on an even playing field then you're the kind of person who really should be concerned about blown calls because they introduce a, an element of unfairness into a contest. Suppose I'm a batter and uh, a pitch comes to me and I judge that it's out of the strike zone so I don't swing at it, but the umpire calls it a strike anyway. Um, it looks like uh, in virtue of the mistaken call, I'm being held to a different standard, a more difficult standard than the other players on the teams, uh, uh, my team and, and the other teams. Uh, who aren't the recipients of this mistaken blown call. And so even if you don't think that there's anything um, particularly worrisome about the mistake, you should still think there's something worrisome about the fact that the different players and different teams are being held to these different kinds of standards. And uh, now the immediate response to this kind of thing is, well, it all evens out in the end. And either uh, you know one team who today suffers as a result of a blown call tomorrow will benefit as a result of the blown call and so there's really no appreciable difference in the kind of effects that these these mistakes have on any individual or any individual team and it turns out that it's empirically just false uh, there are quite uh, predictable tendencies in these in the mistakes that uh, that uh, that officials make whether in baseball or football or soccer and we can tell that in lots of different cases one team stands to gain significantly or lose significantly more than their opponents from these kinds of mistakes. Uh, so for instance in baseball, um, if you're a pitcher of a different race than the umpire, you can, you can predictably uh, bet on getting worse calls as a result of the, different, uh, the, the differences in, in, in race. There's a, some implicit biases going on there. Um, if you're a uh, a team in baseball that's leading in a series, you can expect to get worse treatment uh, from the umpires. If you're the home team, you can expect to get better treatment. And there's lots of different um, predict uh, discovered biases in, in officiating. And so it's just not true that these mistakes all even out in the end. And even if they did, sports just aren't played on the long enough time uh, time uh, table for us to see them be actually even out. Well. So one couple couple questions on that. Um, one is is a concern maybe that 
we're mistaking or confusing uh, just a, a blown call, just a uh, you know the uh, just a mistake on the part of the official versus bias. Right. It strikes me as those are a little bit different. If if a, an official has some bias either towards the home team or uh, some sort of racial uh, 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 bias, uh, that's different than just a mistake where from his angle he just called it wrong because he just saw it wrong. Uh, that does. I mean, my, my intuition is that that's a little bit different of of a pattern there. I mean, one there's a pattern of behavior on the part of somebody. The other is it's just a it's just a mistake. Mm-hmm. All right. So, yeah. how do how do you how do you, how would you uh, correct me on that? <laughs> well, I don't know that I need to correct you. Uh, I think you're right. There might be some simple uh, perceptual mistakes, the kinds of things that where we see things that we just don't that don't actually happen. Uh, I think the the blown call that ruined the uh, perfect game of Al, Al, uh, Armando Galarraga, Jim mm-hmm. Joyce was the first base umpire where he called the runner safe when the runner was clearly out and pretty clear to almost everyone except Jim Joyce. I think that's a plausible case where Jim Joyce just made a mistake. Right. Now, you might think that the reason he made a mistake was because of the immense pressure that the situation put on him. Um, so you you, you kind of want to be able to say that maybe human beings in general are unreliable when placed with, uh, when we have an enormous amount of pressure on us. Maybe that's a kind of bias that we have. Um, but in any case, uh, it doesn't seem to change the issue, I mean, the, the unfairness of the, that's introduced by the blown calls isn't introduced by its being a, a product of bias. It's just introduced as a product of its being uh, unique and the treating one team or player differently than another. Mm-hmm. So even if they're not product of biases, there's still a reason to worry about them being unfair. I agree. I mean, they're, they're, but I think there's where the unfairness is coming from. But yeah. I, you know, there's there's going to be various cognitive biases that we might have, uh, or or cognitive um, uh, weaknesses, maybe maybe a better word, uh, just in terms of of perceptual limits, uh, uh, psychological pressure, and so on, uh, that might influence or affect uh, the cognitive ability to make the call quickly and in, in in the moment, and then. There, and then there's uh, uh, just bias, right? <laughs> Racial bias, right. Uh, or or something similar to that. And then uh, and then maybe just uh, just muffing it, just making a mistake, whatever whatever that is. And all three do strike me as introducing a level of unfairness, mm-hmm. but they they seem uh, a little qu- qualitatively uh, different uh, with uh, just the the racial bias uh, bringing with it. Uh, uh, more uh, approbation <laughs> uh, sure. uh, of it, where in the cognitive, well, those are just things that that we have to deal with or uh, try to correct in various ways, right? Sure. So uh, I think you talk about how officials already use various uh, technological aids in terms of uh, contact contact lenses or things like that, um, and so where where there are obvious uh, ways to augment or correct uh, cognitive is cognitive weaknesses. We can look at that, but then there's just a, a level of, of human, uh, perceptual ability that, that just exists there. And then there's just the mistakes that almost, uh, might be akin to, to luck, uh, or to bad luck, depending sure. on, on how you look at it. So they, in a way, maybe, um, you know, sort of, of deontological consequentialist difference or motivation consequence, uh, difference, uh, in these, in these three categories, they all have a level of unfairness. Sure. But where that unfairness comes from sometimes seems to make it worse <laughs> or at least understandable. Like we can understand someone making a mistake. If you're calling it, if you're called, if you're making rougher calls because the pitcher's black, that, 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 that there's not much excuse for that where you're, where you're making the call because uh, you just, you, you can't quite see from that angle quite rightly. That seems quite different, even though in some ways they're both, they both introduce a kind of unfairness. You're right. It, it, that would seem to be the case, I think, especially if we'd have reason to think that, uh, that, for instance, if an umpire who was shown to have a, you know, a racial component to, to their uh, a racial bias or something that, that was manifested in terms of differential calls for white players versus black players or something like that, then we really worry that, that a kind of overt racism really was infecting the, the calls. But it turns out there's there's less reason to think that that's true okay. than you might, you might initially suspect. In fact, um, some of these biases when I when I call them biases, I just mean that they're that they're just predispositions to get things wrong in, in kind of in a kind of uh, 
uh, predictable way. Okay. Um, and uh, some of these biases are very weird. So, for instance, uh, there, there was a study that found that soccer referees shown the, exactly the same uh, footage where the action of the, t say, for instance, the tackle happened from left to right would, um, uh, and then, then shown the same footage where the tackle happens from right to left, they just flip the footage so that uh, the, diff the direction changes. There's a, dis a striking difference in the likelihood that they'll call the tackle a foul based upon the direction from which the, um, the tackle occurs. That's totally so that, bizarre. <laughs> it's very strange. And it shouldn't make a difference. You would think, well, whether it happens from left to right or right to left shouldn't change, shouldn't, literally can't change the position from which these, these, uh, these officials are seeing the, the action, and yet it does have a difference on their, the likelihood that they're going to change, call it a, a foul or not. Now, which is more likely? Uh, I don't recall. I think oh, it was. Okay. I think it was when it's right to left that it's more likely a foul. And you might think that it's that w this was suggested uh, not by the article, but by a, a colleague of mine. That I wonder if this happens to to track the fact that we lead left to right. Well, <laughs> I was thinking that because you could test that by uh, bringing in uh, Israeli referees. Exactly. Uh, and uh, this is precisely the suggestion that my my colleague had. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Uh, and so you you might wonder if that, that's a kind of a, a kind of uh, a unique sociocultural uh, bias where it's generated by the fact that we ha that much of the you know much of the world happens to read left to right, um, and so uh, when you see things coming from right to left, it's sort of unorthodox to us, huh. and uh, that may result in uh, uh, seeing things as being uh, a violation more often than it. Or the processing in some ways is exactly. is uh, changed, and so you see it in a way delayed, and so you maybe you think uh, that you don't see the the contact with the ball first, uh, and so you think it's a foul or something exactly. like that. So yeah, exactly. And and when it comes to this kind of thing, I mean, social psychologists have been discovering implicit biases uh, throughout human society in lots of different ways. Um, and it, it's not a surprise at all to find these things happening at, at a, an unconscious level in oh, yeah. officiating. So I'm actually inclined to think that, that the racial component that seems to be affecting certain umpires' calls isn't in any way uh, overt or, or, a con or bubbling up to the level of conscious bias. Right. I think it's, it's just a simple fact of, of you know, it, uh, uh, it's a well-established implicit bias that people have in-group, out-group in out disparities in their judgments. And uh, if you look at somebody and judge them even unconsciously as being not a member of your your group, uh, you say or your racial group, then you're going to you're going to unconsciously um, hold them to subtly different standards, and that's going to manifest itself as these different uh, balls and strikes calls in baseball. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I really don't think that most umpires, especially at the elite levels, have those kinds of overt racial um, biases, but they that that may not. That may not help them anyway. Right. Yeah, and and like we said, I mean, it, sort of wherever the source is coming from, it does it still does seem to be unfair. I think maybe the the a stronger concern or or not concern or not. Uh, I don't want to say this. Um, maybe a, an objection that that may have a little bit more weight to it would be that these are in some ways uh, similar to just bad luck. Sure. Uh, and and so that because often right so some teams can have bad luck, good luck, uh, uh, and and we talk about how well that's some um, that also kind of evens out as as well. Or maybe not within the game, but within a course of a season, depending on the sport. Um, I think you the as you call it the win some lose some balance out sort of objection carries a little bit more weight in some sports I think than others. I mean in baseball. Uh, where you know you have a very long season, you also have playoff series that are seven games. There is more of a tendency for sort of fluke luck uh, on these sort of unfair situations to have at least some tendency to balance out. I think you're right that they they probably really don't in, in practice, or if they do, uh, not in a very satisfying way because. You might you you might have a bad call here where it doesn't have much of an impact, whereas another bad call might have a much more uh, 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 meaningful impact on the game. Um, and so, yeah, in in one sense it evens out, but in another sense it doesn't even out at all. So, uh, whereas something like football, where you have very few games, uh, you I, you see the role of flukiness or luck or or, or this unfairness of I think having a much 
much bigger influence on on things, which is one reason why I think football tends to be uh, a uh, have better parity scores than than some other sports is because of of the role of 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 luck uh, involved in it. That's so right. yeah, in terms of okay, so sometimes the 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 ump or the official is just going to make the wrong call, right? Sure. Uh, excluding you know because uh, you, you you talk about corruption, excluding corruption. Um, I mean, there could be some level of incompetence. There's some level of just cognitive biases or some other kinds of biases that might play a role. But is it really that distinguishable from other forms of bad luck? And if not, then where does that leave us? Well, yeah, that's a good question. And this is part of the this is a topic that I initially addressed in the paper, but you know had to cut for space reasons. Mm-hmm. I think one of the concerns here, and and there's another argument which which I think is a good one. Uh, you, you try to put yourself in the perspective of a uh, of a professional athlete, or someone whose job, whose wealth and livelihood <clears throat> depends on your ability uh, to succeed in in these arenas. Now you're an athlete, so what is under your control, you're going to um, control to the greatest to to the degree that you can, and you're going to probably try to eliminate those factors that are not under your control as much as you can. So. Um, for instance, uh, it, you know you see this all the time when um, athletes get caught with doing one thing or another. In fact, you might even think that the the, the rise in steroids is just another uh, an instance of uh, athletes trying to get more control over what they do, mm-hmm. greater greater power over over literally over the, where how far the ball flies and so forth. Well, um, we can't control the weather, but to the extent that the weather poses a problem, we do actually. Uh, take steps to, you know, obviate the effects of the weather. So we play in domed stadiums, or we have rain delays, or things like this. Mm-hmm. We can't control. Um, uh, there's lots of things we can't control, but to the extent that we can, we do take steps. Well, officiating mistakes are something that we can't control, but we can remedy them. Yeah. And so I think uh, if I'm a professional athlete, the uh, I want every technology. Pop that's out there. Every possible technology that that's on the in the works. I want everything out there uh, to be determining these calls as correctly as possible because that's putting into my control even more so than it is currently the the outcomes of my actions. I can't. So if I'm a, if I'm an excellent pitcher, for instance, if I'm a Greg Maddox, somebody who's legendary for his ability to paint the corner of a strike zone, mm-hmm. and and I'm confident in my abilities, I don't want to leave the determinations of where the pitch actually goes up to somebody who's wrong 14% of the time, which it turns out that major league umpires are wrong 14% of the time on when they call balls and strikes. They're actually so bad at this. Um, you might think wrong 14% of the time, right 86% of the time. That's pretty good. It's better than most hitters. <laughs> that's much better than most hitters. But here's the thing. When the balls are near the edge of the strike zone, they're actually only about 50-50. Wow. So right when you're when you're somebody like Greg Maddox, who has excellent control, who can throw the ball consistently near the edge of the strike zone, you've got to think that you're getting the calls. You're getting. You're getting. Uh, um, uh, you're getting. What's the. What's the. Uh, you're getting. You're getting uh, um, deprived of an advantage 50% of the time. You can say screwed. <laughs> you can screwed 50% of the time uh, by these umpires. Now, if, if I'm if I'm Greg Maddox or if I'm any uh, competent baseball pitcher, I don't want to leave my um, you know, leave my future, my success, my prospects uh, up to the whim of somebody who's getting it wrong fifty percent of the time. I want to be given credit for what I'm good at, mm-hmm. and the only way I'm going to get credit for that uh, um, is if we use more advanced technology, the way that we we already know we can use in baseball. So. Um, you're absolutely right. It does have a kind of flavor of luckiness to it, um, good or bad luck. And, and typically, uh, as fans at least, we, we kind of w- grudgingly accept that luck is, a, is an ineliminable factor in sports. And it is an ineliminable. But that, the fact that it, we can't get rid of it doesn't mean that we don't deplore its effects from time to time and that we don't take pretty significant measures to mitigate the effects of luck. So for instance, we, we spend billions of dollars on stadiums and domes and things like this, precisely because we don't want, uh, well, not just we don't want to sit out in the weather, but we don't want to watch the weather determine the outcome of a contest. We want, to, we want the athletes to do that. 
and uh, we don't want the weather to minimize or uh, thwart the efforts of the athletes. So we take steps to mitigate the effects of the weather. And likewise, I think we don't really want the umpire's mistakes to determine the outcomes of the games. Right. We want the athletes to do that. Um, so if I'm an athlete, uh, I don't want I don't want my career to de- depend on luck, and that means I don't want my career to depend on human officials. Right? Yeah. Yeah, and and that makes sense to me. So I, I think that that I, I think that that of of all the arguments that that you talked about, I think the argument for fairness really is 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 the one that speaks to me the most. Is that particularly as a fan, uh, which is my main way of, of being involved in sport, um, is it, it's so frustrating and so infuriating when when a bad call happens in a game, even if it's to your benefit. I mean, you sort of like, oh, that's a terrible call, but I'll take it. But, you know, <laughs> as a fan, you, I'm sure people say that. I know I have. But you just you hate for games to come down to bad calls one way or the other. Uh, and <clears throat> but particularly when it goes against you. And then if you're if you're a fan of, of a team that seems perennially to have those things go against you uh that's even that's that feels even worse and so you know it's it's to the extent that you can reduce those uh you know in a in i mean i you know one i guess one issue and i don't uh i kind of want to get to this i want to talk about maybe some of your other arguments first but um i mean there's a sense of of some balance here i mean it's, it's not that these are so bad that that they're the number one priority that we structure the rules around or the game around, right? But it, so there is a kind of all things considered, we do need to, you know, um, balance it against uh, other other ends and goals of 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 the sport of the whole of the whole endeavor, uh, and uh, and so yeah, we want to do what we can, but not not at the expense of of maybe some other other ends in the game, but sure. Yeah. Uh, so, did you want to, t- to talk about any of the uh, any of the other arguments that that you talk that you raised in the paper? Sure. I mean, uh, the one thing that that uh, the the argument actually I think is the strongest, and because you might not be you might be not concerned about fairness really at all. Um, after all, at the end of the day, uh, the the factors that most significantly determine success in sports are factors which are genetic and. Um, you know, beyond anyone's control. And so really sports are insofar as they're competition between people's abilities, inherently unfair because Mm. no one earns their abilities in the way, in the genetic sense, no one earns the genes that they, that they have that make them like LeBron James, six feet, eight inches tall and 200 pounds and capable of running like a deer. I mean, no one, no one earns that, uh, those abilities. Uh, so you might not be concerned with the fairness issue, but one, The one argument that I think is uh, more sort of nicely captures that something's wrong with blown calls, not necessarily what's wrong with them, but that something is wrong with them, is the, the argument from analogy to corruption. And you just have to look at what people, the way people talk about corrupt officials to see, I think, what most people think is wrong with corrupt officials. It's not actually the fact that the officials have an intention to deceive or do things like this. It's because they act on their intention. And the, it's the effects of the actions of, of corrupt officials that really bother most folks, I think. Um, when you look at the conversations about Pete Rose, what is it that bothers people about Pete Rose? It's not just that he gambled on baseball, um, because, in fact, it turns out that his gambling, um, well, lots of people don't think that gambling on baseball is a problem. But when, to the extent that people will say this, they'll say that the problem with Pete Rose gambling on baseball was that the chance that this would somehow mess up the results, that this would perturb the outcome of the contest, that this would incite Pete Rose, for instance, to, to uh, mess up the game in some way. And uh, the worry with Tim Donaghy, for instance, the NBA referee who was found to have uh, influenced games, was, again, the influence he had on the outcome of the game. So I think what what this all shows us is that the main problem we have with corruption in sports isn't the intention to win by any means necessary. Lots of athletes have that. Uh, it's the fact that they act on this intention and that action alters the outcome of a game from something it otherwise would have been mm-hmm. and what it ought to have been. That is what it ought to have been given the, uh, 
the actual abilities and efforts of the people involved. And I think when you, if that's what makes corruption in sports, whether on the part of a player or especially an official, particularly disturbing, then you ought to be worried about mistaken, honest mistakes for the same reasons. Because the honestly mistaken official call, uh, affects the outcome of the game in exactly the same way that an intentionally deceptive uh, official or an corrupt inf- in- official would. He just doesn't do it intentionally. Mm-hmm. And um, you might not be worried about the intentions at all. You might be worried about what the outcomes are. And so the, 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 the one argument that gets, gets to the, the wrongness, the, the sort of the worry so much, it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't give you an account of what exactly is wrong with them. But it doesn't tell you that, that there's something wrong with them. Hmm. Yeah, see, this one, um, it, I find that I, I'm unsatisfied with it. Sure. Uh, a lot of people, but that's okay. What were you going to say? I said a lot of people are. Okay, good. Um, but, oh, uh, good for me, not necessarily for you. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, is it, it, the analogy just, there's, there's a weakness to the analogy that I, I, I'm not sure I can quite put my finger on, but bugs me or just kind of scratches at the back of my brain a little bit. And because the force just doesn't seem quite that equal to me in, in the sense that the honest mistake, uh, it, in any, any one particular instance of an honest mistake and a, uh, a, a corrupt official. Um, so you have, uh, you know, um, uh, the the official uh, who who screws up the call just from an honest mistake, and someone else who screws up in an identical situation the same call, but because they have money on the game and the call's gonna it's gonna affect writers or someone's paying them off in some way, uh, and it's just a one time incident. In some ways, those those look uh, uh, similar in terms of the effect of of the game, and so that that part I I, I I can see where you're coming from on that. I guess part of it is that if if and when the the intentions get revealed, so we we take a look at this, like what what happened in this case, sure. and it's okay. Well, this it was just an honest mistake. There's no evidence of any wrongdoing in terms of being paid off or having other kind of of motive involved here. It's just just the guy, you know, comes clean and says, oh, wow, I saw the replay and I really, really screwed that up and I'm sorry, whatever, you know, uh, and uh, like like with the um, uh, Joyce, uh, the the official uh, that you were talking about earlier in, in terms of the perfect game, he afterwards said he, he, he came right out and said, yeah, I totally blew it All right, or something to that effect. Right. Versus uh, if we said, OK, well, here's this call and, and uh, we discover some uh, – something curious in, in the bank account uh, and and comes out that he was paid off to, to blow this call. That does seem to really change our perspective of it. I, and it, it does make the, the corrupt one seems a whole lot worse, yeah. even though in some ways the outcome to the game and to the season and to everything else would be identical, right? Because uh, X hypothesis is just, this is just a one-time thing. Sure. Um, it still seems so much worse uh, in terms of the, the corrupt official than the honest mistake. And so partly it's the intention, partly it's, it's the, uh, um, the sense of, of maybe of sympathy or empathy with, with the honest mistake where we can say, yeah, all of us have been there. We've all made mistake in that kind of situation versus the corrupt. It's like, well, there's a, uh, I've been reading some Adam Smith, so I'm thinking of Concord and Discord here, and and so you're just sort of looking at at uh, at the corrupt guys. I, I can't relate to that at all. What were you doing? Uh, and so there's a real dis uh, a disconnect there, and and so the the analogy really breaks down for me uh, on that point. Even if even if what really wrong with it is the fact that it changes the outcome of the game, and so they're indistinguishable. The intentions do seem to play much more of a role than uh, than I think. Uh, uh, you, you've discussed you discussed in the paper at least. Yeah, in general, I mean, you're pointing to the perfectly, perfectly uh, ordinary intuition that malice is worse than incompetence. Yeah, yeah, um, right. But uh, I, I, I think that's true in general. Malice is worse than incompetence, mostly because incompetence isn't reliable in a way that malice is. Mm-hmm. Um, it turns out that when we're talking about officiating mistakes in sports, malice or incompetence might be 
actually just as reliable as incompetence. That is, we might we can I think reliably expect officials, even honest officials, to get these mistakes, um, to make these mistakes all the time and in predictable situations. Mm -hmm. So let's ignoring that for a moment. You might think, well, does the wrongness and corruption consist only in the uh, the mistake, the effect that it has on the outcome of the game? And I'm not, I don't need to say the answer to that is yes. In fact, I'm perfectly willing to say there are lots of features of, of malicious intent that, uh, of corruption that make corruption worse than um, uh, honest mistakes. But to the extent that, the, that part of the uh, problem with the corrupt official is the effect that it has on the game, to that extent, I think you should be worried about honest mistakes too. Mm -hmm. And you think... Um, if we, if suppose we found out that we had a uh, a um, an official who was corrupt that who had the intention to affect these games but who was turns out uh, oddly incompetent at being corrupt right and was never able to actually alter the outcome of a game and was never able to uh, actually t flip a game from you know uh, affect the game in such a way that the that the team that should have won didn't win um, would we be bothered by that? It doesn't seem like we really would, as a as a sports fan, we kind of laugh at this person and say, "Well, you you, pr you probably shouldn't be an official if you're not if you're if you're so bad at being an official that you can't even be a good corrupt official." Mm -hmm. But it doesn't look like we'd be ha we'd have a real problem with them insofar as they affected the outcome of the game because it's sort of the necessary element there seems to be missing. And I think that's that still shows there's something about the, in my view at least. Officials are paradigmatically functional. They're there to do a certain job. And to the extent that they fail to do that job, we ought to take their failures seriously, whether those are intentional failures or simply incompetent failures. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, so I, I guess I don't want to push the stronger view that the only thing wrong with corrupt officials is that they alter the, uh, the game in, in a certain kind of way. But I do want to say that we ought to be concerned with honest mistakes as much as we are concerned with corrupt mistakes insofar as they affect the outcome. So it's a bit like a, a kind of strict liability rule. Doesn't It's, it's not really why uh, the thing was broken, uh, but it was broken, and so you're, there's a kind of responsibility there no matter what. I think that's fair. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I'd, I'd still be pretty concerned about the in, incompetent corrupt official. Uh, <laughs> be, you know, but as you said, you know, you shouldn't be an official at that point, uh, both because you're incompetent uh, and two, because you're you're corrupt, you're willing to to uh, you know you you you've disqualified yourself from from uh, being an official because of your willingness to be uh, corrupt. And I mean, I think another parallel here that in some ways I think strengthens this argument is that to the extent that the uh, that the frequency of blown calls and then uh, what we may be call the impact. Uh, or significance of those blown calls, uh, that to the extent that that's greater, uh, and so you're, you, in your paper you, you cite uh, some evidence for the, at least the frequency aspect of it, that it's a lot more frequent than maybe we're willing to, uh, that we normally acknowledge. Uh, and so I think that gives it, that gives it uh, some, more, some more force. But I think it also begins to show that even if there's, a lot, if there's honest mistakes, and there's a lot of honest mistakes, then the integrity and legitimacy of the game is called into question. And that seems to be the very concern about corruption, is that any one small act of corruption may not threaten the legitimacy of, of the game long term or anything like that. Uh, but certainly enough, you know, I don't know how much, but at least at some point it will. And then same with honest mistakes. If there's enough incompetence uh, or just honest mistakes going on, then, then the overall legitimacy of, of the contest uh, even if it's not from from malice or bad intent, uh, is still going to be called into question, and that seems to be what you're trying to get at with this analogy between corruption and and mistake. Yeah, that, I think that's that's certainly part of it. I mean, we, we definitely want to think that the results of sporting contests, at least generally writ large, tell us something about the quality of the people who are participating in these sports. Tell us something about their abilities. Tell us something about their relative abilities and how they measure up against each other. But uh, a lot of that gets called into question if we pay close attention at just how bad uh, officiating can be. And if it turns out that it's even worse than we suspect, then 
much of what we value about sports, this ability to tell us about something, tell us something about the quality of these people who play it, uh, goes by the wayside. So, it, the the overarching uh, part of the paper has just always been: if we take sports seriously, if we want these these uh, sports, these contests, to tell us something real about the people who play them, then we need to take seriously the the role of officiating mm-hmm. and make sure that we get these calls right. right. And, and uh, I, I say in the paper that getting these calls right, right um, means using technology and in some cases pretty advanced technology. Other right. people are, and, and this is where a lot of people get off the boat. It, it's a simple, you know, my modus ponens is other people's modus tollens. <laughs> willing to endorse the, uh, you know, the antecedent uh, and accept the consequences of that. And other people are, sort of, are, are unwilling to accept the the conclusion that we ought to use technology and so are willing to jettison even the the basic assumption that we ought to take sports seriously and so i see this a lot when i teach this in in uh, my my philosophy sport class i have a, a, a fair share of students that when they're faced with the dilemma do you want to uh adopt advanced officiating technology or do you want to just give up on the notion that we ought to take sports this seriously they're willing to say yeah we ought to give up on the notion that we should take sports this seriously now are these um uh, the the students were are, are they because uh, most of my uh, students uh, in my sports ethics class are, are athletes themselves, um, and uh, I, I I don't know if they would come down that uh, quite that way, although I suspect if if forced into that dilemma I, I suspect maybe they would, um, but but there's a third option uh, there. But first of all, answer uh, answer my question about uh, are the students athletes or are they uh, coming from somewhere else? Of infrequently, they're athletes. So you, most of these students are just a wide uh, cross section of um, of students from around the the university. Okay. All of whom are interested in sports to some degree or another. Occasionally, there will, will be athletes, but I haven't had the opportunity yet to have a, a an athlete whose livelihood is likely to depend upon their athletic ability. Yeah. Oh, I haven't either. My, we're Division Three, so <laughs> they're 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 certainly not going to be making a living at at being an athlete. Although maybe most of them hope to be coaches in in some way or another. Um, but so, I mean, a third option there is a, an option that you dismiss rather quickly in the paper. And I, I think for good philosophic reason, but I think it's probably a lot more common uh, among uh, non philosophers. Uh, is is the is the sort of positivist view, um, and which is the where you're getting the name of your paper, the, the spin on the column as I see them uh, claim. Uh, and so I, that does strike me as a possible third view for many sure. people that a lot of the people involved in sport are going to say, well, look, it's just, it's not that we're not going to take sports seriously. Uh, we take the sport seriously, but uh, the official, uh, it, by making the call, sets the way, sets the reality, so to speak, of, of the situation. Right. And so you... Yeah, so you, you say, okay, well, look, it was out of the strike zone. Well, the ump called it a strike, so it's a strike. Regardless of where it came in, it's a strike because the ump called it a strike. Uh, and so you, you, know, you, you argue against that, so maybe you could just briefly uh, state what's, what's wrong with that view, and then we can talk sure. a little bit about it a little bit more. Sure. I, I think in general, when push come to, comes to shove, people are just unwilling to, uh, to bite that bullet. I, I don't think very, many people really want to accept that what the umpires say constitutes or determines what in fact happened. Uh, because it's essentially, it's, it's the, the old adage, you know, who are you going to be, believe, me or your lying eyes? And people really, these day, this day and age when we were, were given you know, high definition, slow motion, instant replay, you know, uh, it's very hard for us to swallow when we see in, you know, 1080p that the, that, that was a catch mm-hmm. uh, when the umpire says it wasn't. In fact, it, there's, a, there's a pretty easy case to, be, to, to make that the umpires are, in fact, the worst people in the world for making some of these calls because they're, they're f- faced with a situation where they're too close to the action that's happening too quickly, and they're under too much stress to be able to make some of these calls adequately. Right. And so you see this when you see, uh, you see some of these most famous blown calls where you think, how could anybody have missed that? And yet the people who were closest to it missed it. Right. So in general, I think people are just, when faced with the choice of, of, decide, of, of siding between 
the what they themselves can see and with what somebody who's in a much worse epistemic position um, judges they're they're going to they're going to want to say no no we should go with what actually happened we can tell with what we can tell what actually happened we should go with that right they're willing to 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 junk the positivist position but there are other sort of philosophical weird uh, absurdities that show up with with the positivist uh, view where what an ump says just is what happened and i think people in, in general don't want to go that way i think arguably the reason it positivism ever had a foothold in this discussion was simply because there wasn't any alternative to what the umpire said. Right. That before the advent of the television camera, no, there was no one to say um, what happened other than the umpire. Well, and before, before you had that technology, the umpire was in the best position. That's and, right. And so, but now right. uh, I think, uh, you know, technologically wise, uh, they're not. But now, one reason why I think it still has some hold, at least partially, not not in any kind of consistent sense, much like, I mean, I'm sure you ha have this, this issue too, where most of our students come in and they say things that, that are, are uh, just straight up subjectivist ethical relativism until you really push them and they're not really very consistent on it. They're ethical relativists until they get to the Nazis and then they're not, <laughs> right? And that's it, right? But so they're not willing, you, you push them, they're, they're only going to go so far. And I think that that's probably true with the positivism too. They'll probably, the, there is some measure that they're willing to accept it to a point, but they're not going to go full hog on it and be a consistent positive, positivist right. in the, much the same way most, most aren't going to be full, fully consistent subjectivists. Uh, but I think that one of the, the reasons why it might still have some of a grip is because as a fan or as a participant, in some ways you have to adopt positivism to get through the game. Because, because what I mean is, is you're watching the game and you see, you know, through, through pitch tracks or whatever, that it clearly was a strike and the guy calls it a ball. But the game has to go on. There's nothing that you as a fan or even a participant, you know, you're a participant, you can maybe uh, appeal it, but there's only, there's a limit to that. And at some point you have to go on and treat it as if it is a strike when clearly it wasn't. So there's right. some measure of having to adopt at least a psychological, uh, a psychological positivism just to continue to, to, just to continue the game and just accept the ruling and say, well, that do you have to treat it as if it's a strike, even though, sure. it, even though it actually wasn't. So sure. I, I wonder if that's why it still has some measure of, of a grip on people. That, that's certainly, uh, I think that's certainly part of it. Um, we all, at the end of the day, I mean, uh, well, as of right now, it happens to be the case that there's nothing we can do about these mistakes, at least in terms of the rules of the game, that what, the, what the rules allow us to do. Um, I'm pleased to see that the NFL, at least, is starting to wise up a little bit, and they're considering some rules changes. I just saw this uh, yesterday or the day before, where they're considering opening up um, replays now to um, to making all penalty uh, calls uh, eligible for replay. Mm -hmm. um, now, and I would hasten to add, though, that I'm not a big fan of replay. Uh, so, in fact, one of the things that people seem to find a little odd about my papers that I'm arguing to <laughs> use technology, but probably not not instant replay. Um, and and so I've gotten beaten up over the years for thinking that instant replay is the you know for allegedly calling instant replay. Uh, for everything, but I, in fact, I think instant replay is one of the worst things we can use for making these calls, um, because it, it, of all the reasons that people don't like it, it's slow. Um, in many cases, it, it, it raises difficult pragmatic issues about how many challenges we should afford and mm -hmm. you know, about how long we should allow the referees to make these kinds of calls. So I'm I'm not a big fan of replay, although I think it's it's better than the alter it's better than nothing. Mm -hmm. So if given the choice between uh, giving, you know, allowing every play to be replayed uh, to make sure the calls are right before playing the next one, and nothing, I'd take replay every play. Um, but uh, I know I'm, I know I'm a kind of outlier in, in with respect to that. I just, I think the better alternative is to make sure these calls are gotten right in the first place, which is by using advanced technology that can be integrated into the game in a way that obviates the need for replaying it in the first place. So give, so give some examples of that and, and sure. how that and, and what, uh, so what the basic idea is. Well, you mentioned one already with pitch tracks or pitch FX is the system that's in use already in Major League Baseball. It's the system that currently tracks every single pitch 
thrown in every single game by every single pitcher in Major League Baseball. We can, uh, and it's got an accuracy rate of something like 99%. It's the system that is being used to tell umpires how well they're doing and where they're getting calls more consistently right and more consistently wrong. So it's a system that's actually resulted in umpires getting better at their calls and getting more consistent in their calls. But it sort of immediately raises the question, well, we have a system that's 99% accurate. That's so accurate that we're using it to grade the umpires. Why are we having umpires do this in the first place? We already have a, a system in place which, can, which is tracking every single pitch. Why not let give that information to the umpires in real time and let them uh, report it, if you like? If you don't want to get rid of the umpires, then don't then give them the tools that we know uh, we already have. So you could have sort of a, just a sensor that goes off and it just beep. That's a strike, and, the, and there's no uh, there's no. Well, you probably you probably still need the umpire there for other for other kinds of calls that maybe there sure. isn't technology for, but that the the balls and strikes would just be almost automatic based sure. on the technology. Yeah, I don't see any reason why we couldn't do this. And we already have umpires consulting with their pitch counters to make sure that they're not uh, calling, you know, so they're not calling a fifth ball or a fourth strike, uh, or making sure that they're not, you know, calling a batter out on two strikes. Um, that's a simple technological aid that prevents a lot of um, unnecessary mistakes, and mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a valuable addition. I don't see any reason why at this stage we can't just give umpires a little a gadget, even an iPhone or a new Apple Watch, with an app mm -hmm. that tells them in real time, whether it was a ball or a strike. It wouldn't slow the game down at all. It would completely eliminate the need for any kind of instant replay of balls and strikes calls. It would um, completely eliminate, I think, the embarrassing umpire arguments, uh, arguments between umpires and coaches and umpires and players. Because when, when the system is shown to everyone to be reliable 99% of the time, I think you'll see a, a noticeable drop off in these kinds of disputes. Look, if everybody knows that the system is right and the system says that that was a strike, then that was a strike. The problem now is that in baseball especially, especially everybody knows the umpires are wrong a lot of the time. And, and because everybody knows this, you see a lot of these arguments and, and sort of embarrassing tirades when managers justifiably get very angry at umpires who – who the umpires know probably got – the umpires themselves know they may have gotten it wrong, but they're being intransigent for the for sort of political purposes. They can't, uh, they can't give in on any call because if they give in on any call, they'd have to – they'd face pressure to give in on every call. So and, why <clears> – I mean it sounds, sounds so reasonable. Why would anyone object <laughs> to that? I, I, uh, Sean, I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, well, baseball is a special case. You know, baseball is a, a unique game where – Tradition holds an enormous weight. Uh, Pete Rose is not still in the Hall of Fame because of something that happened in 1919, arguably. Right. It's it's not Rose's sin that he's paying the price for. It's the Black Sox sin. And baseball has had this code for a long time that uh, it's been slow to change. It's been slow to to adopt uh, new technologies and new new traditions just because of the kind of inertia. Uh, so when it comes to baseball, I think you don't have to – and you wonder why, why don't we do this in baseball. I think the answer is just because, well, enough of the participants and enough of the fans are unwilling to adopt it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that will change eventually when, when it becomes clear that uh, there's no loss in entertainment value, for instance, or no loss in uh, enjoyment from the, from the perspective of the fans or the players. And I think one way to see this is that – the uh, Major League Baseball is getting ready or at least proposing to change the rules again for the strike zone. Partly the reason for this is that um, the pitch FX system, which has been so successful, has been successful also at getting the umpires to call the strike zone more uh, uh, closely to what the strike zone is currently stated to be in the rules. Now, the reason for the current state, the, the, with the current strike zone is described, it was meant kind of to, to force umpires to overcorrect. The umpires weren't calling enough low strikes. And so in order to force the umpires to call the strike zone lower and lower, Major League Baseball lowered the uh, strike zone, at least the rules describing the strike zone, um, to below where they actually wanted the umpires to call, knowing that the umpires wouldn't call it that far down. Right. So they said... Um, you're not calling enough low strikes, so we're going to lower it, even though we know you're not going to call it down here, to get you to call it to where we want it. 
Well, now with pitch FX, the umpires are actually starting to call the balls where they where the strike zone is officially supposed to be, not where Major League Baseball wants them to call it. So they're they're considering raising the strike zone back to where they want it to be. Now using pitch FX as a way of enforcing the, uh, encouraging the umpires to call it where it in fact is and where they in fact want it to be. Mm-hmm. So the more we get, the more we see that that umpires can be can uh, can get better at this, and the more we see that technology can play an important and useful role in this, I think the less resistant folks will be to uh, to adopting it. I am try- I've been trying to consider some of or any unintended. Uh, effects of of introducing a technology like this, and the similar things I think you could do in football for goal line technology in terms of having chips in the ball and so on, um, and uh, and I suppose even for home runs and and uh, uh, and and field goals and stuff like that to to use some sort of, of chip GPS combination or sure. or tracking. Um, just trying to think of of what sort of unintended effects because I mm-hmm. you know we talked a little bit about replay and one of the things that that I think is a concern about replay although I I I, I, I support having replay for many of the reasons that you suggested right it's better than having nothing uh, but and I think we saw it play out a couple times this year in terms of the 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 what actually begins to constitute a catch at this point becomes such this ornate metaphysical affair <laughs> that it, it's it it takes a lot of of the joy out of the game uh in terms of uh so there's there's two there's two things there one is just what actually constitutes a catch now and so that's become more complicated where we used to have more of a common sense uh feel to it that looks like a catch it's a catch now it's you know, you have to have this football move. You have to hold it in a certain way, and all this, all this stuff, and and slowing it down and, and putting it into slow motion and so on. Uh, in some ways, ch- has changed the nature of the catch, and I think that that's a that's a concern. Uh, and that's, it, great. that's a great point, and uh, and and it's affected the game. No, it's a great point, and it's something I've, I was thinking as well when I was seeing these uh, this discussion about the the Des Bryant catch in the playoffs. Right. I think it's the one you're referring to. Yeah, it's, one it's of them, definitely yeah. an issue. And um, it, it's not clear that this is really a problem for technology, um, for using technology in officiating. It seems like it's just a general problem with the fact that we are now, as spectators, afforded a much better view of the action than we had been all along. So I think you're going to f- see the same kinds of issues crop up, whether or not you introduce technology into the officiating uh, um uh, realm at all because after all spectators are going to be upset whether Des Bryant's catch is ruled a catch or not um, because what they see is going to disagree with what the rules say mm-hmm. and so at any point whether it's whether we need, whether we're deciding this on the basis of introducing the officiating technology or not we're going to have to uh, you we're going to have to uh, Modify the rules, change them somehow to make them more clear, or make them, make them more accessible and more easily determinable, um, easily judgeable, I guess. In light of what we are now seeing with high definition mm-hmm. uh, slow motion into replays, because they're not going away. The only question is whether or not uh, we're going to take them into consideration in making the determinations of what happened on the field. Yeah, I mean, my concern is that what I see is is them actually making the rules more complicated rather than sure. trying to make them. More streamlined, so that sure. it's it is less of a uh, uh, a technical affair, um, precisely sure. for the reasons that that you said. But uh, it seems they're actually going the other way to try to even make it more precise in a way that makes it so overly technical. Uh, and then this also gets into the other concern that I think that that arises because of replay more so than than just technology is is now that you there's a touchdown you're excited but you have to look and watch uh-huh. right it was it going to be a replay is there a flag is they going to challenge it uh is it going to get called back um i mean so some of that's not even replay that's just the officials in terms of the flags but that's, that's a great what, point but that yeah. speaks to the overall context here of 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 uh you know blown calls you know are they calling uh the penalty correctly or not and, yes. and so you, it takes out that whole excitement of scoring a touchdown because you have to wait for it to become a, a official, uh, an official score, and and that uh, uh, that's that's something that I think is a, is a concern. 
you're certainly right. I mean, it is the sort of thing that, that counts as a kind of cost from a spectator standpoint. Um, as sports fans, as people who enjoy watching sports, we enjoy a certain kind of experience, and that experience has a rhythm to it and a and a, you know predictable ebb and flow, which strangely we're not bothered by. It's you know the interruption of commercial breaks, but maybe we ought to be. Um, but well, I think still- we are. I, that was something else. That, I mean, I wasn't going to bring up, but you brought up. I actually think we are bothered by that more more than more than you acknowledge. At least in. Well, at least I am. <laughs> yeah, I certainly am too. But but no one, I mean, you you'll never hear anyone on ESPN, for instance, uh, re, you know, um, suggest that they ought to change the rules that uh, prohibit commercial breaks from interrupting, uh, you know, basketball games or football games. Just, yeah, well, they just, might not be in the best position to to make that argument on ESPN, exactly. right? But I, uh, yeah. but still, you're you're certainly right. There is a kind of cost to this from the spectator standpoint, and 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 here's this is a difficult issue here, and 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 it's one where I'm not quite settled on it. You know what? What is the real trade-off, or what is the real correct way of balancing the conflicting interests of getting the calls right and getting making sure that the the, the right team wins, and making sure that the spectators are pleased? And I, I'm not so sure uh, how. I, I I simply don't know how to weigh those kinds right. of considerations. In general, at least with a lot of uh, contemporary American sports, with uh, especially NFL and college collegiate football. I think you have to expect that people are so uh, engrossed in these sports at this point that any changes, really, it, it would have to be an extraordinarily dramatic change to the fans' experience to force a significant number of people to, to turn off the television. Oh, yeah. Um, and so I, I'm, in, I'm inclined to say that, that uh, no matter what you do, if it, as long as it doesn't uh, like fundamentally alter the experience of the of the fan. You can get away with changing just about any rule you want, and people will still watch. So I guess I, I guess I'm inclined to think that if that's true, um, we ought not to worry too much about what individual particular fans are going to think about the the delay in celebration, because of course they'll celebrate anyway. Right. Um, so, but but in other sports, especially in, in in lesser watch sports, things like the WNBA, which are you know constantly struggling for viewership, there's a definite there. I think the 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 effect that any rule change will have on viewership really does make a difference because it it, it goes straight to the sports solvency, mm-hmm. and um, I think that's going to be something you have to deal with on a case by case basis. And I, I don't know that there's a general principle. I'm- now I think uh, you know earlier you said that um, baseball seemed to be a special case, and I think you're you're right because I, I can see football and some of the other sports, uh, uh, you know, introducing this technology and various kinds of technology, and we've seen football kind of lead, be be the leader in replay and um, and and uh, uh, you know many other sports are, are adopting the these rules. Uh, but there's some resistance. Baseball and soccer seem to be resistant. Maybe it's just the longevity of both of those sports and the importance of tradition. Um, <clears throat> but there's this element when you talk to people uh, who are not fans of the uh, uh, the rule cha- technological introductions into baseball, the the so-called human element. That sure. They almost want the errors to be part of the game because right. they've always been part of the game, and it's just you know having the empires, having the arguments, uh, are just are just part of the game, uh, and and uh, uh, and and so you know you talk a little bit about that uh, in in your paper, so uh, so maybe you could touch on that there because I think a lot of the, a lot of people are going to say, well, you know, it's just you know the, the empires and their mistakes, it's just part of the game, it's just sure. The, yeah, there certainly is part of the game, um, and I don't want to dispute that. But I, I want to dispute the significance of that that point. Um, uh, lots of things are part of the game. Uh, lots of really terrible things are part of the game. Um, before uh, before Jackie Robinson, it was just part of the game that Major League Baseball right. was an white man sport. You know, before hard helmets, it was just part of the game that leather helmets were, and 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 you know, catastrophic head injuries were just you know part of the football. And there are lots of Good and terrible uh, things that are, as a matter of fact, part of the game and part of its its particular uh, characteristics. Whatever game we're talking about, whether it's football or baseball or basketball or or rugby or anything like that, 
But the question that we have to ask ourselves when in each of these cases is, well, should it, should it be? You know, is there a good reason for it to be part of the game? Is this something we ought to strive to, can, to preserve or strive to eliminate or just, you know, ignore? And with officiating mistakes, I think there are convincing reasons we ought to take what, what reasonable steps we can to eliminate or mitigate or correct them whenever they occur. Um, and when, I, when people mention the human element to me, I say, well, um, when you go out and play backyard baseball, is it, is it important to you that, that uh, there's an official? And they say, well, no. Say, well, why not? Because, well, it's because it's just baseball. Well, and the answer is that's exactly right. It's just baseball. And what baseball is paradigmatically is a, it's a game between two teams of players. And the umpires only factor in as a kind of stopgap for certain kinds of uh, uh, problems. When those problems don't arise, they're not important. Right. And, and so that, that that goes back to what I was saying earlier about the, you know, the paradigmatically functional role that officials in sports have. Insofar as they're doing that their jobs well, we ought to keep them around. But insofar as they do the jobs poorly, we ought to look for different alternatives. And so when when people say, but but I still like you know I like watching umpires go ballistic or watch I like watching managers go ballistic and throw throw their hats and spit in the dust and things like that. And I say, well, maybe you do. We say, but <clears throat> um, maybe you shouldn't. <laughs> right. There, there are lots of things that, that we like seeing in sports. We like watching car crashes in NASCAR. Let's, let's, just, let's just call a spade a spade. Um, a lot of people watch Daytona and watch Talladega precisely because those tracks are well known for producing massive pileup accidents. And um, whereas the, the races which are more closely fought – the road races, the, the short track races where, you know, there's lots of contact but very little spectacular accidents, they don't get nearly as much attention. Mm. Lots of people are fans of the spectacle and not as much of the sport. Right. And, uh, and it, you know, when I also, you know, ask people this and just you know, think about it for yourself. Suppose I had to give you a choice between a human umpire who is perfect and an, uh, and a machine, a, a mechanical system, which is wrong. 14% of the time, which one would you prefer is your officiating um, crew, the perfect human or the imperfect machine? Most people are going to say they'd rather the perfect human, um, but that perfect human is missing the most human element of all, namely his imperfection. Right. So uh, really, I don't think people care too much about the existence of the human element, which is to say the existence of kind of random error rate. Um, they... They, when, when given the choice between um, a person who gets it right and a person who gets it wrong, they'd rather the person who gets it right. And when you start asking them, they don't really care that, what, too much whether it's a person. Um, and uh, so uh, I think in general people are, are just kind of inconsistent about this point. Um, and if they're not inconsistent, they're, they, they're just, I think, paying attention and enjoying too many of the wrong things. And, and what I mean by that is that they're enjoying too many of the um, uh, the fights and the mm -hmm. brouhaha's when they ought to be enjoying the elegance of the of the excellent pitcher and the impressiveness of the uh, batter with an with a sharp eye for balls and strikes. You know, and the, and there's still going to be uh, a place for those arguments, right? Because uh, as much technology as is out there, there's still going to be things that I that at least I think are, are you can't really eliminate with technology and and in some ways this is uh, an important thing to to bring up I think is that the more subjective sort of calls uh, are the ones that seem to cause more of the problems uh, and they also seem to be the ones that are least uh, uh, affected by a technological fix so I'm thinking of fouls in basketball uh, what's a catch in football or pass interference in football? Yeah. Uh, that, Personal fouls. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that those seem unsportsmanlike conduct. Yeah. Yeah, that, and those are uh, those seem to be ones that uh, have the biggest impact. Uh, also, are in some ways the most subjective and also least eliminable by by a technological fix. And so, it, you know, I, I think a lot of this is is balls and strikes. Uh, I mean, those are obviously important to baseball, uh, and getting them right is is important. Uh, but it it seems that these other things are going to be much more. They have much more of an impact. It, it, that's where officiating mistakes seem to 
to really have more of an impact. And they also, and that's where technology isn't just going to be able to fix those. And so there's still plenty. One, if you like the arguments, there's still plenty of room for that. So you're not going to remove that. Um, and uh, another element of the inconsistency is that, to some degree, we always talk about how if you don't see the officials, then you know it was a well-officiated game. It's sort of like they, when they're doing the job well, you don't notice the officials. And so there's there's a sense there, of, well, if you really want the human element, don't you want the officials in the, in the game? But we don't want that. We, we want them on the outskirts, in a sense, just to make sure that the rules are followed. And so if there's some other way, uh, uh, as you put it, a functional way that can do that better, that you know, I, th I think we we ought to look we ought to look towards those. But it does seem that there's still something there within the game that the officials are going to have to be there, and they're going to have to make subjective calls, and they're going to get those wrong. And there's really no way around that. I think you're right, and sometimes they will get them wrong. Although in in this in those as you can say judgment call kind of cases, it's less clear that they're getting it wrong. Um, that uh, that there's a wrong way to get the call. In some cases, you you, you can view these, especially foul calls in basketball or um, personal foul calls and offsetting penalties, technical fouls, and so forth. Um, in football and basketball, you can view these as a way of the umpires managing the conduct of the players. Yeah. As a as a kind of carrot and stick um, uh, reinforcement mechanism for for you know keeping the players under control. And if that's the way you think about these things, and there's an even there's another reason why you ought to uh, support officiating technologies for the judgments of fact, right? The balls and strikes, the fairs and fouls, and those kinds of things. Which is that if if I'm an umpire, or if I'm a player, let's say, and uh, I'm just I've just gotten called for a pass interference uh, flag, um, and five minutes ago the very same umpire totally botched. Uh, the call on whether or not my uh, my my interception was a catch or not, I'm going to respect that umpire's more recent flag much less than I would if he had gotten the first call right. Um, so the error rate on the judgments of fact is another exacerbating uh, factor in uh, increasing the kind of disrespect that the players and, and coaches have towards the umpires when it comes to the judgments of uh, you know these other judgment calls. So. The umpires are less are able to do their jobs less well when it comes to managing the conduct of the players when the players don't respect them because of the how how how, easy, how obviously mistaken they are in these other kinds of cases. I think if you want to if you want to encourage umpires and encourage the respect of umpires in sports, you ought to uh, favor introducing uh, technology of the games to remove from them the the uh, the calls which we can more easily get right. And save for the umpires just those calls where technology wouldn't really help us, mm -hmm. and kind of um, let them be specialists in this in, in managing the good conduct of the game, and don't undermine them by saddling them with these other kinds of difficult tasks which they're unable to to, to do. Well, great! Thanks for coming on the show, Seth. Thanks for having me, Sean. This has been the Sports Ethics Show. You can find us at sportsethicist.com, Facebook, and Twitter, and you can email the show at sportsethicist at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for listening.